Welcome to Wonderfest 2016. Um, I want to thank the Wonderfest committee for inviting me here. Dave, Dave, and Lee. Thank you so much. These guys are awesome. They do an incredible show every year and it just gets better and better and better. It's just can't say enough. Um, I also want to say thank you to the family of Dr. Frederick Ira Ordway, of which his son and wife, Albert, are sitting right over there. And thank you for joining me. It was very special. Thank you for Jeff to bringing his moon bus, absolutely astonishing recreation of the filming miniature over here, put his heart and soul into it for many years, and also for contributing to the book. He was integral to getting a lot of the information correct with using current state-of-the-art technology to figure out how to reverse engineer images and really, really bad blueprints. So with that said, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit. This, What is this lecture about? It's about the life and work, uh, particularly the work of Dr. Frederick Ira Ordway III. He was a pioneering rocket scientist, and he was the senior contributor to directly under Stanley Kubrick in making the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. I had the honor of meeting him around 2009-2010, and uh, we very quickly became friends. We were on the same wavelengths, and it was an honor to be his friend. Anyway, how did this all start? So, next image, please. Up until 2001, A Space Odyssey, this was the state-of-the-art state of the art in spacecraft design and film. As you can see, it was basically a flying saucer or, or alien vehicle down the lower right. This, is, this basically summarizes almost every science fiction film made up until 1968. Or some variation of Werner von Braun's V2 rocket on a gigantic scale. So the focus of this lecture is how Dr. Ordway, working with Stanley Kubrick and 300 engineers, the top scientists in the world, who went to Bournemouth Studio, changed film history and changed history of rocketry and space travel as we know it by bringing to the public this kind of information in the form of a fantasy film. So we're going to start off with how this all started. Next slide, please. Okay, the first serious science fiction film where they actually hired a scientific consultant was this film. This is an actual still from the UFA archives in Germany. This film was Woman in the Moon, made in 1929 by Fritz Lang, and the director of the film in regards to the scientific direction was Hermann Oberth. If you've heard his name, it was considered to be the, rocket, the father of all rocketry and space travel. And in my latest book, I talk a lot about how important he was and why he was considered to be the father of rocketry and space travel. He designed this rocket, and, then, and if you're familiar with the Apollo Saturn V, there's incredible similarities in the, in the basic functioning of the unit as a multi-stage rocket and how it would take off, go into space, and all the things that would encompass rocketry you know, at that time. And so this was literally the first serious science fiction film. It was a turning point in film, and it also gave Fritz Lang an uh, enormous amount of respect up to this day as one of the great directors of all time, because it was very, very serious about how he approached his topics. And in his mind, this was not fanciful. And Hermann Oberth used this movie as a launch pad to the public for his ideas, which at the time were considered to be ludicrous, about sending a rocket into space with a human being on board. Next slide, please. 1936, this film came out of Russia. It's called Cosmic Voyage. Very few people have heard of or even know about this film. I want to reiterate by saying everything I'm showing you, Frederick Ordway showed Stanley Kubrick in 1965 to make Kubrick aware of what had been done so Kubrick knew in his mind, what to do or what not to do in directing his own film. Cosmic Voyage was very similar to Woman in the Moon, technically, that they hired it to the scientific consultant. The scientific consultant on this film was Tsiolkovsky, who was the father of rocketry and space travel in Russia, a very, very important figure in, in pioneering rocketry and space travel history. He designed the rocket up here, 
The rocket was a gigantic moon rocket, similar to the one in Woman in the Moon, except it took off on a horizontal uh, launch pad that slowly swept up and then released the rocket. The beauty of this uh, that was explained to Kubrick is that the sets were built on a massive scale, the miniatures. This miniature we believe today was about 30 feet long, including the hangar that it was in. When you see the film, the camera very, very slowly moves all the way around the miniature and you see little figures moving and stuff like this. So in 1936, this was the state of the art in filmmaking and it was not seen in the United States. So how did Fred Ordwick get a hold of this? Well, he just happened to be friends with Yuri Gagarin. He, he talked about the Russians a lot. He had a lot of respect for their scientists. And Yuri Gagarin told him about this film and somehow managed to get it. And it was shown privately in Kubrick's offices in 1965. Next slide, please. This is another very important film. Um, this is called Spaceship One Starts. And there, it's like Germany's version of Cosmic Voyage. Gigantic sets, gigantic miniatures, little people walking around, very believable visual effects for the time. This is the mid-30s as well. And in this case, it took off very similar way. It took off horizontally, went up a, a, launch, ramp, a launch ramp, and slowly made it up into space. And the scientific advisor on this is actually unknown, but they believe it was all the rocket scientists that developed the, the uh, V2 and the V1 in Germany, because Germany used this as a Nazi propaganda tool and said, we will hide this from the capitalist, horrible people over there in the West. They will never see the film, but they did. <laughs> so, it's a very short film. It's actually kind of a documentary more than a movie. Next slide, please. The next film after that would be Destination Moon, 1950. Uh, the, the scientific consultant on this movie was the famous author Robert Heinlein. And he uh, was a great writer, as we all know, and he, he tried to direct the, the director on how the rocket would take off from Earth and land on the moon. The only thing that was a little bit out of control was landing the rocket backwards. The, even to this day, they say the technology to be able to do that is, is really, really difficult, to land a rocket backwards upside down on the moon. Um, so that, and also they're showing, as you can see in this still, and it was well known back then, there, were, there was no water on the moon, so the, you know, this, the broken up surface showing indications of water was completely fanciful, but a very good film for its time. Next slide, please. Then the next great leap in film design would be Conquest of Space, 1955. The scientific consultant on this was Chesley Bonestell, who had been working with Marshall and the U.S. Space and Rocket Center and Von Braun and Hermann Oberth. And these are actually Von Braun's designs of what he thought would be a real space station and a real means of getting human beings to Mars and exploring Mars. And I, I, more information that was brought to the table to enlighten Kubrick on, on what would be believable and what would not be believable. But again, you can see very, very simple designs. So they, they, apparently they didn't even consult Von Braun to use these designs in the film, but they thought if it's okay with Bonestell, his buddy, and we would put it in the film. And everybody was great with it. A very technically advanced film for the time. Very straightforward storyboard here. Next slide, please. Now, this is probably the most important film that Kubrick relied on. This is a Russian, another Russian movie called Road to the Stars. Has anybody heard of this film? Raise your hand if you have. Do you? have it on DVD up in my room. Very, very good. Now, if you, you, we've all seen 2001 A Space Odyssey. Doesn't this just look very similar to the light Aries coming down, slowly lowering itself to the moon? The lighting, the design, the cinematography and stuff like that. Very, very similar feel to this. It was a documentary style feature film, just like um, Cosmic Voyage and uh, the German film Spaceship One Starts. Next slide, please. Space Station looks virtually identical on the inside, doesn't it? You know, curved space station, the curved floor, the way it's photographed, the way it's set up. So you can see there's some direct visual and technical inf uh, visualizations going here and parallels between 2001 Space Odyssey and this film. It was used as a technical reference for cinematography, engineering, designs, and all these other things. But again, very, very simple. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so now we get to the scientists. So, in creating 2001, A Space Odyssey, the first person that Stanley Kubrick asked, how do I start this whole thing? Who do I talk to? So he talked to a, his friend and colleague, a guy named Roger Carras. Roger Carras said, well, as far as I'm concerned, the best science fiction writer right now is a guy named Arthur C. Clarke. So he said, okay, sounds good. So they contacted Arthur C. Clarke, and Arthur C. Clarke got, got his start for Stanley Kubrick by showing him a little tiny short story in this one issue Pulp Fiction comic book called Ten Story Fantasy, published in 1951. You'll see Arthur C. Clarke was so unknown at the time, he didn't make it to the front cover anywhere. So anyway, the, movie, the, the short story was called The Sentinel of Eternity, which was used as the basis for the entire script and philosophy of the film about aliens, super intelligent, almost on a godlike level, planning things for mankind to discover at a certain stage of it. And it was written with a colleague of name by uh, McGowan, I believe. And Kubrick had this on his desk and he was thumbing through it constantly, trying to figure out how to integrate this into a screenplay. So, because he was very aware that aliens in science fiction movies were completely unbelievable before that, it was designed for, in his opinion, 11-year-old boys. He wanted something serious, and this was the first book that was really seriously looking at life outside of the universe, outside of Earth, excuse me. And he proposed it in a way that if we found life, it would be really hard to tell if it was alive or not, based on our known science at that time. And then, um, and then things started to evolve from here. So here's a, now being directly related to 2001 and Space Odyssey, Frederick Ordway was, was then hired, and then he was assigned by Stanley Kubrick, you need to find me the top minds in the world that have to get this film perfect, scientifically credible. So Frederick Ordway brought everything he could possibly bring from NASA and Marshall Space Flight Center. We're talking boxes as big as, as, as many of that would fit in this table. Boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff from Marshall Space Flight Center's Advanced Projects Division, and he had to have clearance from NASA and the federal government to do this. A lot of this was still considered to be classified. So he brought all this information, showed it to Kubrick and Clark and Tony Fruin, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick's assistant, so that they could figure out, okay, how do we start designing this movie now? The look of it, we've got our story now, based on Clark's novelization, the little short story, and the, thing, the credible things around it based on Ordway's writings. So, this is how they looked at it. So, it, for, this is an example. This is the evolution of the one-man space pod that I wanted to show to you how quickly things evolved in that film. So, in 1952, over the, the left here, we've got the Von Braun bottle suit, which is an incredibly practical design for the time, and it was seen in the Disney films, and hopefully you'll remember that. Now, hidden under the table, and it's explained in this book here, Boeing very secretly was designing one-man space shuttles for deep space exploration missions. Wow. There's the 1960 one-man shuttle. There's a little man to scale to show how small it was. The 1961 Boeing shuttle. And then Harry Lange and Frederick Ordway and the German scientists were designing this one-man shuttle in 1962 at Marshall. That's a Marshall design. And you can see it's slowly developing to what looked like in 2001. And then brought to the table, physically brought to Borumwood, was Honeywell's design and Boeing's 1965 design. Now we're getting something that looks practically close to the pod scene in 2001 Space Odyssey on the lower right there. Of course, Lange's sense of cosmetics and ergonomics and stuff is light years beyond anything before that. It's, it's just a beautiful design. So that's the evolution based on this specific thing in the film from what Frederick Ordway and all these and Harry Lange brought with them. Next slide, please. Now going to the shuttle design scene in the film, this is the evolution of the shuttle here. And again, all this was brought to the table. 1952, Von Braun designed a little passenger shuttle that was supposed to sit on top of a rocket. And then 1955, Dornberger, a Marshall scientist, and Kraft Eric, working for Bell Aircraft Company up in the Northeast, designed what is truly the ancestor of the, not only the real space shuttle, but the Orion. 
a little passenger shuttle that sat on a booster that took off vertically. And then Dornberger and Eric redesigned it based on known philosophies at the time to be a little more aerodynamic dynamic the same year. And then Eric, Kraft Eric with a team of engineers at Bell, Bell Air, uh, Aircraft designed a, a very streamlined version in 1960 that they actually tried to market to Continental Airlines and Pan Am and TWA at the time. And they all said, we just don't have any interest at this point because we don't have a billion dollars. <laughs> but the booster that the Bell Aerospace Shuttle look, uh, sits on looked very similar to the pre-production designs that the Orion at the bottom would sit on. The Orion was obviously, again, the most cosmetically attractive shuttle and the most believable shuttle in the scientific realm of how things would function. So you can see a clear line of evolution here and, in my opinion, a leap. Next uh, frame, please. Okay, this is something I found. This is the first evidence of a shuttle slash booster design. This is 1954. This is a publication. And it just happened to be the guy who wrote the article, Ken Gatlin, was at Warrenwood advising Ordway and Clark. There's a picture of him in the, in the first volume of my book. And he wrote this article. So this is the first ever known information on a passenger shuttle that would launch on a booster that was published. It's, you can see it says Bell Aircraft down there. Next slide, please. A little historical background. There's uh, my miniature of the Dornberger shuttle, so you get an idea of what it looked like in three dimensions. Next slide, please. And then this is another publication of showing the booster evolution later on that same year, early 1955, of the Dornberger shuttle. So you can see, there it is, and they're advertising in a major magazine. I think this is Vogue magazine, I could be wrong, but it was obviously published to millions of people. Next slide, please. There's the barrel, uh, it's the original artwork from uh, Bell Aircraft that came out of their museum. Excuse me. And you can see there's, in this case, it's a horizontal takeoff of booster that looks kind of like a modern jet. And you can see the, sh the shuttle sitting on top is actually quite large. It's a passenger shuttle that could probably hold 30, 40 people, something like that. Again, showing the evolution. This is right before they started production on 2001 Space Odyssey. The real world examples that they were deriving their designs from. Next slide, please. Now, when we get into the discovery, which is the star vehicle seen in the film with the ball on the end and the giant train of triangular storage modules and the nuclear reactor in the back. How did that go evolve? Well, there was nothing like that in any film made. So they had to go to Marshall Space Flight Center's archives that Harry and Fred were working at. This design here was very, very important. There's two designs here. They were designed by a guy named Ernst Stuhlinger, uh, another genius that was taken working under Von Braun, working at Pina Munde on the V2 project that was brought over by the U.S. Army. And this is the earliest design around 1955, 56, something like that, of his deep exploration research vessel at the top, and then about two years later, he redesigned it again. The top one here, you can see there's a little rocket lander right here. Here's the reactor core. No, that's the habitat sphere. Sorry, it's really blurry from my angle. That's the habitat sphere up there. That's the reactor core. And what are these things here? That's the propulsion. Ernst Stuhlinger designed ion drive, which is still used today in satellites and deep exploration probes. He was a genius in designing propulsion systems for deep space exploration. And this is his idea on a very large scale. This vehicle he proposed would be about 1,200 feet long. It was gigantic. This is a multi-deck habitat area here. And how did he create gravity? Well, he had a spindle here, and this whole thing revolved like this around the core right here. And that was the communications antenna to Earth. And he, they seriously visualized this going to uh, Mars on manned missions, groups of them exploring Mars. And then he realized at a later time the ion engines were really good for sustaining long distances, but not very good at leaving Earth's orbit. They just didn't have the power. So he redesigned it, that it would have a NERVA nuclear engine for rocket vehicle application, 
engine right here, and the ion drive would be here, and it would displace after it left Earth capture orbit. And then the ion drive would take over at a later time and take it to Mars. And here's a close-up of the habitat sphere. Oh, and I wanted to remind everybody, these are also Harry Lang paintings. The guy who designed everything in 2001, Harry Lang again. So you're seeing how important these guys are in, in the 20th century and the history of rocketry and space travel and film. So he was painting all this stuff for Ernst Stuhlinger. I believe these paintings still exist, but I have not got confirmation. So how did they create gravity in here? The same way they did. This is the axis of rotation, and this rotated like this. And these boom arms, after launch, extended out from the core. They literally came out like a antenna or something like that. There's one on each end. Same scale, gigantic scale. These things here are heat radiators because ion drive generates uh, apparently about 3,000 degrees of heat that has to be displaced constantly and not and aiming away from the sun. So that's why they, they're big fat panels they could angle them to make sure that it was perpendicular to the sun's rays hitting it. So because the sun would heat it up very, very quickly, making things difficult. So you can see we're already on the path to designing this discovery from the work done at Marshall Space Flight Center by Stuhlinger, Harry Lange, visualizing his ideas, and Frederick Ordway, who was part of this whole team. Next slide, please. Now, this is the Boeing design, which is the closest thing to discovery that came out. This is an original painting done by a fellow named Robert Federley, working for Boeing at the time. Sorry, the resolution's really low. This is all I got. And up here, you can see there's a habitat sphere right there. Twin antennas, a long, long tapering body, very similar to the, to the uh, Discovery. And at the back, we've got the fuel and a reactor core. And in this, in this case, and it's orbiting Saturn as per Arthur C. Clarke's novel. So it's visually similar to Arthur C. Clarke's novel. I don't think that's a coincidence. And at the back was a, a Dyson nuclear pulse drive, which is what was seriously considered all the way up to actually production filming time. Freeman Dyson, one of the people I interviewed uh, for the film as a scientific consultant, he's, I think he's still alive, Freeman Dyson. Anyway, he came up with a pulse drive where the the engine would release nuclear particles and explode them behind the vehicle and it would literally project it forward through a series of propulsions. So it was very, very effective and very seriously considered, but Kubrick didn't like the idea because he thought of it was too many ties to Dr. Strangelove. So anyway, the next slide. Enter scientist number 100 and something or other. <laughs> that, that helped Frederick Ordway on this film. This is a guy that I've talked about in the first book and also in the second book here. His name's Thomas Widmer. He's never been mentioned anywhere, and the only reason I have this information is thank you to Ms. Dr. Frederick Ordway. Uh, Widmer was working for General Electric uh, at the time, who was a very serious conservative, uh, contributor to the film. And Thomas Whitmer was the, one of the world's leading experts on nuclear propulsion as a means of rocketry and space travel for deep space exploration. And he described in this book right here, which was given to Stanley Kubrick in 1965 by General Electric, Mr. Whitmer himself, through Frederick Ordway, this book right here. They actually, keep, Stanley Kirby got the first edition of this, which was softbound. It's in the traveling exhibit as we speak. You'll actually see this book, but with a slightly different cover. And this is what Kubrick visualized his whole film would look like. So if you want to look at this book down my, my table, you get an idea where Kubrick's mind started visually. What's with this book here? And in that book, and this was owned by the artist who, uh, who actually illustrated the book, so this kind of cool history there. And what Mr. Whitmer came up with was two designs. And the first one, very similar to the Discovery and Basic Concept, and especially the early study models of the Discovery that you'll find in the making of 2001 books. And his original idea had a habitat sphere inside the ball in the front. Unfortunately, the bureaucrats stepped in and said, we can't afford that. So they just converted it over to a Gemini-style blander over here. 
kept the brute exactly the same. And you can see I'm referencing Mr. Frayling's book right over here. So if you go to these pages in his book, you'll see the early concept designs of the discovery and how they almost exactly matched this. So that's the scientific background right there. Next slide, please. This I found in Dr. Roadway's uh, archive. As far as I know, this is the earliest drawing ever done of the discovery for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Nothing predates this. We believe this was actually drawn up in his New York offices before they moved to Borum Wood. Now, based on all the slides I've showed you before this, you can see that they stole a lot of ideas from GE and Boeing, Marshall Space Flight Center, and all these different companies to start the process of the design. There's the Stuhlinger nuclear reactor, the Stuhlinger cooling plates here, and one of these things right here, that's the ion drive. So the initial design of the discovery was basically a Stuhlinger Mars vessel, but per Clark's novel, had the habitat sphere with three pod bays. That was always in the design because it was in the novel, or I should say the screenplay that Kubrick and Clark were developing together. So this is the earliest you can see. It's half, Whit it's part Whitmer, part Stuhlinger, part Lange, part Clark. It's a little bit of everybody all thrown together. And when you visualize the discovery in the final design, you can now clearly see the evolution of this vehicle here. What this giant pole is, I don't know. I'm going to assume that there's probably antenna communications or something at the end of each pole. But again, it's a gigantic length, about a thousand feet long at this particular point in time. And they thought due to the gigantic mass of this, it would have to have many, many, many ion engines that could be turned and controlled to control the, the direction of the, of the vehicle in space. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, my discovery here, and I'm, I'm hoping to rewrite the history books with this discovery. Uh, Fred had this hidden, when I say Fred, I always know that I'm talking about Frederick Bordley, had this hidden in a box that was labeled 2001 that he brought back from Borumwood with him. And I looked at it and I went, wow, the first thing I noticed is it says Alson Station right here, which means basically orbital station. And you can see it looks exactly like Von Braun's space station design that was seen in Conquest of Space, the Disney films, and model kits of various different kinds. It's, he has a dimension at the very top that's being covered, but it's about 200 feet across. It's got one deck in there, support things. You can see a V2 docking here, a space telescope at the top. This dish captures the sun ray, so the sun's rays, and focuses it to a boiler that generates electricity. So this would obviously say 1950 or earlier, okay? So I took this original drawing and I flipped it around, and on the back of it, written in Fred's handwriting, it said, Werner, Werner von Braun, 1944. So this predates every everything that's been written about Von Braun and where he got a space station design start. Everybody thought he started it here in the United States after he was brought over. It says, 1944, Pina Monday, Frederick Ordway, Von Braun. Remember, Frederick Ordway was Von Braun's confidant. He trusted Frederick Ordway in the highest level of detail and manner, and Frederick Ordway wrote a very personal book about the life of Von Braun and the work of Von Braun after Von Braun died. So I trust this is authentic. If it's in Fred's information, I believe it. It's that simple. I contacted the Smithsonian, by the way, and other experts on Von Braun, and they said they had never seen this before. We believe this is the authentic item, that this is truly Von Braun's earliest design of anything related to space travel. 1944. So, um, anyway, there it is. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure what to, oh, I remember what I was going to talk about there. If you have a look here, you can see the layout of the crew quarters and people, beds, decks, kitchens, and stuff like that. This is very reminiscent of the Space Station 5 seen in 2001. 
and also the centrifuge layout inside the discovery. So it's, it's kind of harmonious to both, and that would explain why it was in his 2001 box. Next slide, please. This is, I think, the coolest picture of the space station I've ever seen. It was, I think it was taken by Fred. It doesn't have the stamp of the standard photographers right here, and you can see the space station sitting on the floor. And if you want to zoom in, you can see the level of detail this photo is. I think there's a little slider thing or something like that. This model, if you didn't know, was eight feet in diameter, so it was that big, the wheel. So now we're seeing the culmination of how these designs evolved using information from all these scientists all over the world. To, you can bring it back on again. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I don't know. If I had Photoshop, I could get in. <laughs> That's good. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> you can see how things evolved very quickly in the mind of Dr. Frederick Ordway trying to assist Stanley Kubrick in visualizing the film. And kudos to him and Harry Longy and Tony Masters and all the people involved in, in making it a signature look for the film. The twin arms, the entry port inside, the gigantic scale of this thing. It's just, it's really beautiful and it's really iconic. So this is my favorite photo of the space station that I've ever found. Next slide, please. Okay, some of the scientists, that's Dr. Ordway on the left, Frederick Ordway. Uh, some of the scientists involved, these are some slides of uh, the many, many groups of scientists who are given tours. Uh, Frederick Ordway was always the person assigned by Stanley Kubrick to give the tours. And you can see that on set, that everybody had a dress code. Stanley Kubrick wanted his top, top staff to be very professional at all times because they were under scrutiny by the US government, the British government, and um, MGM. So these people, on this particular occasion, these are several generals from the US Army that were stationed at, in England at the time these three gentlemen here, and they're giving the grand tour, and I'm sure Frederick's saying, well, this is our space station, and this is where we do this and that and the other thing. So, General Michaelis, uh, Bartocha, and I forget the third guy. Next slide, please. These are two consultants and scientists from Hawker Siddeley Dynamics. Hawker Siddeley meaning the people who made the famous jets and the World War II aircraft. And um, you can see Fred is one of those rare times where he's looking right at the camera. <laughs> and anyway, these guys put an enormous amount of effort in designing the control panels inside the pod. In fact, they, they managed to get Hawker Sibley Dynamics stamped right in the pod. I don't think you can see it in the film, but it's on the sets. And it's a beautiful, beautiful shot showing what was really going on behind the scenes with all these really high profile scientists and people um, working with Dr. Ordway on getting everything scientifically believable in this film. Uh, next slide, please. Here's Dr. Ordway is giving a tour to uh, Richard Leakey. Anybody know who he is? Remember who he is? Yes, he actually made sure that the ape sequence was correct at the known at the time to be based on known theories of anthropology and the origins of human beings top scientist in that field in that time. To, and the gentleman in the middle is a guy named um, Bevilacqua, who was one of the top computer scientists in the world working for IBM. He worked with um, a whole team of people to make sure that how a computer was believable, how a function was believable, and how it looked was believable. So he was basically a computer consultant. And again, Frederick giving a, a tour, in this case, the space station Five, yeah. Next slide, please. These are some cool behind the scenes images from Fred's personal library. Uh, this is the construction of the passenger area of the Aries right here. They're basically building it. You can see the toilet on the right, and they haven't even built the central elevator yet. And just the extremely high level of construction quality that the Mr. Kubrick insisted on having all the time. And the level of detail following Harry Lang's drawings to the letter, etc., etc., etc. Next slide, please. 
another really interesting shot of the passenger area. I'm showing these images because they're not published. That's, I just thought they, they were more fun than, than academic interest. Next slide, please. And there's a man working on the, the um, passenger area of the Aries, and you can see this is taken from the outside of the set, looking at how well built the set was and stuff like that. You can see how big the sound stage was at uh, Borumwood there. I think the ceiling was 45 feet or something like that. It was a huge, huge room. Next slide, please. Now, here's a real rare one that, to the best of my knowledge, is the only existing painting outside of the Roy Carnan Library in England. Roy Carnan was one of the visualizers that worked with Ordway, Tony Masters, and Harry Longy on visualizing what Harry Longy's designs would look like as filmed to work so that the production designer, Tony Masters, could convert that into the real world. And this has never been seen outside of Frederick's uh, home till today. And this is the um, antenna dish that he preconceived with Harry Longy that would go on the center of the discovery that the astronaut did the spacewalk on. So we believe the original painting is actually gone. So, but this is a very high quality reproduction of, you know, truly professional grade reproduction. Next slide, please. Uh, what you're looking at here is a true piece of history in my mind. If you, can you zoom in on the bottom right down there, please? Yeah. Uh, it just goes to the uh, center of the oh, image. The image. Don't, don't worry about it. Should people click and drag the image? Here? Where? Uh, or just... Oh, there yeah, we there you oh, go. There we go. Okay, see what it says down there? Uh, where is it? Vickers Engineering Group, England, right there. Drawing is uh, copyrighted by Vickers Armstrong Engineering. They built all the bombers in World War II and the nuclear bomb, jet bombers and stuff like that. So Frederick Ordway somehow convinced Vickers to build this for Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> I guess they had nothing better to do at the time. <laughs> so uh, this is what they call an iso isographic, isometric, isometric view. Uh, it's not perspective. Of, you can zoom back now. Um, this particular drawing was done on clear film, and it's about eight feet wide. This is one of about 600 drawings that Vickers drew up on detailed construction plans of the centrifuge, how it would work. Um, a lot of people ask me, what's this giant thing right here? Well, that's how they got the hot air out of the centrifuge from the lighting. It was a blower that drew the hot air out of it. You can see these concrete platforms to keep the thing literally breaking and rolling down the, the, the stage floor. So the whole thing's 42 feet high with an internal uh, circumference of about 35, 36 feet. So Vickers designed and engineered and constructed the centrifuge for Stanley Kubrick and MGM and all the folks there. At the time, it was one of the largest sets ever made for a film as far as a physical working set. So there's that nice piece of history there, nice find. And that's, you know, just photographed on the wall as, as discovered, no restoration or anything like that. Next slide, please. <laughs> Let me see if I have to zoom it out first. Yeah, yeah, zoom it out. Anyways. Hit the minus there. There, there you go. Okay, here's the moon base that inspired Jerry Anderson to make the moon base for Space 1999. You can see a lot of parallels. This is not from Space 1999, I assure you of that. This is from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And how did they design this? Well, they, they, Frederick Ordway knew all of these people, obviously, including Kraft Eric and Stuhlinger and all these other things. And Kraft Eric, working for Bell, was starting to conceive the idea that the moon would be the, the ultimate place to get all the materials that need, Earth would need as, it, as the population got out of control. He foresaw all of this stuff. And he was starting to design a moon base at that time and published a book. And he actually never did publish the book when he died in the mid-80s. 
and he contributed to uh, a lot of the philosophies through phone conversations with Kraft Eric in um, upstate New York, wherever Bell was located from Borumwood Studios. And they said, okay, here's uh, living areas here. You can see they, they, they wanted the design circular because they thought it would follow the, the visual form and function of the craters on the moon. Then over here you can see pipes and stuff like that going from some sort of central processor where they would create water. This is the, the, the central meeting area of the whole moon base facility. They envisioned about 180 people living here that would cycle through every 90 days, come and return to the moon from uh, you know, the, the round, big round airy shuttle. This was astrobiology where they grew plants that created oxygen and it was all figured out in very, very high detail how they would do that. This would be an oil manufacturing facility over here. And somewhere off to the left or the right is where the Aries landed in that famous scene where the dome opens up and it goes underneath. So uh, it, it, it's not just a model, okay? It's a model of something that they believed would really work based on all these consultants that came along and, and said this is what we think would, would happen. The model you're seeing is about 20 feet across from from there to there, sitting on a base about 30 feet in diameter. So it was a huge model. Next slide, please. Here's a close-up of the, of the uh, biology area, the factory, the pipes leading into the central facility and the moon base headquarters. And again, the, the beautiful form and function. They built a study model about six feet across, and then from that study model, uh, the modelers worked with Harry Lange on his drawings to create this gigantic moon base miniature that you barely saw in the film. It was kind of sad. You, you, they just skimmed through it with, through the windows and then you never saw it again. You can see just a beautiful little construction of the design and the thought that went into this thing. And, and you really never saw it. It's sad. So now you're seeing it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. Now we're getting into the um, more of the blueprints that were never published before. I got about five minutes, and then my friend here, Jeff, is going to talk about he how he created this moon bus over here. This was the hardest thing that I ever restored as far as the original blueprints and drawings. You're seeing seven drawings that were stitched together, and I had to figure out what each little drawing that was cut up was somebody's knife that bore them wouldn't throw in a garbage can. The friend, thank you, thank God, took home, right? <laughs> so you can see here's one section, because I had angled that. This is another and another and another and another. And then looking at pictures and close-up pictures of sets, I finally figured out, oh, this, this goes behind the two seats in the command sphere. And then there was parts missing that were knifed off for some reason. So the areas that are blue is what I filled in based on looking at photos. So it's, it's pretty accurate. So those are the blue areas that were missing, cut off by somebody's knife. And this blue area right here is where they changed the set at the last minute and said, oh, we want buttons there. So they glued a couple of buttons right on it. This is a big doorway opening that went up into an unknown area that nobody's ever figured out. Next slide, please. Uh, I put this in the wrong order. This is supposed to be like half an hour. <laughs> This is Martin's design for a deep interplanetary space vehicle. Again, very serious thought and study went into this, as proposed, again, at Marshall Space Flight Center. And you can see it's got a habitat sphere just like the Discovery, docking port here, these are windows, two EVA pods that are connected, control tubes, a big antenna, and back here, a Nerva engine. Nuclear vehicle for rock, a nuclear engine for rocket vehicle application. So that was their discovery. I call it discovery. Their discovery. So again, more history and stuff that evolved into what we saw in the film. Next slide, please. Okay, taking my friend Jeff's drawings. This is the rest. This is uh, a publishable version of his 3D CAD drawings that he painstakingly drew and created that. And so. What I did for publication in the book is basically look at, like, make it look like photos of the filming miniature. That's basically all I did. And Jeff will go into detail in a, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Here's another uh, blueprint that was heavily restored because it was in, you know, pretty awful condition. This is the Orion 
panel that went on the side, and then they stripped out the buttons and changed them around a little bit and made it into the Aries panels that went on to the sides. Again, all, all Harry Lonnie's drawings and, and designs. Next slide, please. And this is the Orion, based on all between melding the original blueprints and photos of the filming miniature and taking all of that and melding it together, I created what I believe is the most accurate six view academic drawings of the Orion to, up to this day, including, you know, for the modelers, you know, the shading of the panels and how they airbrushed it and colored it and all this other stuff. So that's the Orion right there. Next slide, please. Now here's a really cool photo. Now, the original drawings in the set show the crew pad, the, the crew sat up front, uh, as seen in the movie, and then again as seen in the movie. The, the stewardess magically appears out of this back room, walks down the aisle, grabs the pen out of the guy's, out, out of midair, and puts it in the guy's pocket in the passenger area, which is again a beautiful design. So, what room did she come from? Well, over there is the crew cabin where the pilots sit in the Orion. This is the Orion. And right behind this wall right here is the passenger area. This is the galley and the entrance to the Orion that was never filmed, but it was built. You can see again the beautiful ergonomic design of Harry Lange, a, a beautiful blend of engineering, technology, and graphic and industrial design. You can see why George Lucas hired Harry Lange to design all the interiors in Star Wars films. It was the same man. Next slide, please. Here's a really beautiful shot of the Orion filming miniature. You could zoom in a little bit to show the detail. Shot beautifully photographed and so on and so forth. Very nice. Next slide, please. And here's another shot of the filming miniature. If you look right here, and here you'll see wires going through the entire model. And the reason for that is because you remember towards the beginning of the film, the Orion was sitting there rotating with the space station as it was in, in approach. How did they do that? Because the, the model was rotating. They had no other way to do it. They suspended it on wires between two points and rotated something on either side of the model to make the model rotate very, very slowly in front of the, which was then obviously superimposed in front of the miniature of the space station. That's how they did that. The wires going all the way through the model. And then, straight in. So that sequence of the, uh, it was actually filmed first for the movie. Then they took the wires off, and at a later time, they redesigned the hump here, made it a lower profile and fatter, added another sort of doodad right here, and then changed the cockpit to have a steeper angle, then re-photographed it for the first time you see it in the film. So they filmed it actually backwards. So at the space station, it's the big hump version. And as you see it slowly gliding up at the beginning of the film, where you see the Dr. Floyd sleeping and his pen floating out, was the second revision of the model with a lower hump. So there's actually two versions of the same filming miniature, and nobody really knows why, why it was changed, or at least nobody lies. So. so that's the history behind this interesting photo right here. Next slide, please. And here's a, I'm showing this like the space station. This is the coolest photo I've ever seen in the pod. You can actually read the writing right here when you zoom in, barely. So it's a very, very high resolution photo. And somebody left their coffee down here. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on a really gorgeous power. <laughs> you can see the model kit parts that they used, even on this full scale pod here. And just the, the quality of construction of this is completely believable. You really believe this is a real working space vehicle. I don't think any other film that really shows this level of, of quality in, in care and making sets for films. It's a pity they don't survive anymore. I think that's it, Jeff. Are, are, those, like, yeah. are those supposed to be like handholds? Yes, yes. Yeah, in deep space walking, the, the astronaut could grab it and sort of 
carry himself a, a, around the pod in some way, shape, or form. Um, the back up here is actually a camera, is actually a HAL eye. And this is a HAL eye as well. And Those then, aren't the thrusters? No. There's a, a, a vertical thruster right. in, in there. These are vernier or attitude thrusters. And then there's forward thrusters right here and here. There's two cylinders right here on the back of the, of the vehicle. I think that's it, isn't it, Jeff? Is there any more? Goes back to the beginning. Yeah, that's the end. All right. Uh, is there any questions, really quick? I got about two minutes. <laughs> Anything at all? Eleven fifty-seven. Perfect time. Is there any chance that any of the other miniatures survived? I know they recently found the Aries, yes, and that's owned by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Sold at auction for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. A filming miniature from this film. We believe that's the only one. There's that one picture of the space station kind of rotting way out. Yes, it did. It was having daisy eggs growing in it. It's sad, isn't it? And then it was bulldozed. Yeah. I've actually got the newspaper articles stating directly from the local news in that area, Compton News or whatever it was, saying that there was the pod miniature, the Discovery, the space station. MGM was ordered to bulldoze it. It was witnessed by the children at the school. Yes, sir? Adam, how much of the uh, design was in contention maybe that it wasn't actually functional? Like I see ribs on the bottom and things like that. How much of the flourishes that weren't really scientific? And what, what contention was there between the design? I think that's, I think that's just, you know, beauty, beauty stuff. I, you know, I mean, who really knows? Unless I had Harry Lange here saying, you Harry, what was going through your head? Um, it, it's hard to say. We can only guess. Um, it could be structural support, but Harry Lange was, he was not only, you know, academically trained from a scientific point of view to design, illustrate, and draw, and all these other things, but he also had a very, very strong sense of aesthetics. So a lot of the stuff you're thinking and seeing here, I think is aesthetic. And, and remember, these design changes went through almost weekly, if not daily. And in most cases, there was a final drawing. There was a final drawing of this, and a final drawing of the space station, and so on and so forth. But there's always little details that didn't, that ended up on the model or the real set that wasn't on the drawing, all these little things. But the pod actually ended up 99% to the drawing. And then, you know, they used letter set to uh, rub on decals to get all these writings on there, which was all conceived by Frederick Ordway and his team of 300 engineers that worked on this. And the claws, in this case, were manipulated through a vast series of robotic and mechanical electrical systems inside. They were not human operated like a, a puppet or a mop, but they were actually mechanically controlled remotely so they could see what it was doing. And they moved so slowly, Cooper had to speed up the film to make, things, make it look correct and, and move very fluently in the film. So, anything else? Did I answer your question? Did they build a full interior on one of the pods? Yes, they did. Yes, and it did fit. One of the pods had um, no interior. One of the pods had a full interior. And then the other pod had just the manipulator arm mechanics in it. So each pod inside that was completely different. Are they uh, fiberglass bodies? Yes. And, uh, fiberglass and epoxy and lots and lots of gel paints and <laughs> sanding in between and you know respiratory failure <laughs> respiratory failure and <laughs> yeah, you name it i'm sure the guys didn't wear a lot of protection back then so anything else i think we can wrap it up then if you have any more questions i'll be downstairs in the dealer room and you can ask me there thank you so much for your time i hope you enjoy it